It's 7 p.m. Pacific time, and I get paged. Netflix SPS is down. We have over 69 million subscribers, and this is prime time, a performance issue. The pressure's on. G'day, my name is Brendan. I'm a performance engineer at Netflix. I was just introduced. And I've got years of experience analyzing and root causing performance issues. However, for performance engineering, most of the time, this is a process that takes hours and days. For SRE, instant response, we need to be able to solve performance issues in minutes. Last year, I volunteered to join the five SREs at Netflix to go on the core SRE primary on-call rotation. So now I have shifts, and I get paged in the middle of the night when Netflix has an issue. It's been a great experience, and I chose to do this to develop myself professionally and to see firsthand the issues that SREs are working on. It's also been terrifying, and as I've learned, the traditional performance engineering, the process of using profilers and tracers, reading documentation, reading source code, this doesn't work when you need to solve an issue in minutes. So this talk is about performance checklists. And I'll be talking about ones we can do via dashboards cloud-wide and also on the instance over SSH. I said I worked at Netflix. We have over 69 million subscribers. We are deployed. We, are, we have customers worldwide. We're in almost every country, which is awesome. And I introduced myself. I'm now doing SRE. Uh, this is a graph of SPS. You might hear me mention SPS a number of times. SPS is starts per second. And that's a key business metric that we use to understand the health of Netflix. It trends very well. It's a very strong indicator of reliability and performance issues when customers are unable to begin hitting play. So a, a start per second is when someone hits play. And that's what we track. There's a, a graph, there's a Netflix tech blog post all about SPS, and that shows the daily pattern of people watching Netflix. So as I've learned, performance engineering is not SRE incident response. And for more background on performance engineering, this is the aim of performance engineers. And we have a performance engineering team at Netflix. There's uh, six of us, is to deliver the best price performance possible. This is a process that can be endless. So we can work on an application for days and weeks and months. Uh, we can work on new instance types. We can work on databases. It's continual improvement. There's no real ending point, just the best price performance you can find. It's also. Uh, the fixes, as I said, can take a long time. We also, as an engineering team, a performance engineering team, can take on projects that other individual teams wouldn't be able to staff. And so maybe there's a, a language that's being used at Netflix. We don't have a language team who's responsible for performance optimization. We don't, may not have a, a specific Java team or a specific Node.js team. And so the performance engineering team can help deliver projects. That's something we've been doing by getting profilers to work for these different languages. A lot of our work, there's usually no prior good state. So there's no, there's no starting point. Make this application faster. We think it works well right now. So you have to figure out whereabouts in the application to begin. Uh, there's no spot the difference. It's also solo and, and team work. So price, improving price performance is great, but it's not a critical immediate priority. To give you an idea of the sort of tools we're using in performance engineering, we're using all the Linux tools. We use everything, love performance tools. There's, there's always too many and not enough. So too many that do the same thing and not enough to cover the metrics we're missing. We'll go through source code. We'll read all of that. Use cloud-wide dashboards. Um, in, the, in the middle panel, I've got PMCs. We use PMCs as well to understand low-level cycles and flame graphs or profilers. So basically everything. SRE perf incident response is quite different. Now, with SREs, we can do traditional performance engineering work because there's a need to be done at the company. 
But when it's incident response, the aim is to resolve an issue in minutes. Netflix is down and it's prime time, and we can't spend hours running profilers and reading source codes. We need a quick resolution. And with SRE, we can scale up, roll back, redirect traffic. That's what's important. What's important is getting customers, uh, ma making customers happy as quickly as possible to resolve that pain. Uh, and that's more important than price. And so it's quite a different context. In performance engineering, it's about price performance. With SRE, we can scale up an application. We can redirect traffic to a different region and worry about price the next day and then do root cause analysis on what went wrong. Also with SRE perf incident response, you must cope under pressure. So I've been paged in the middle of the night to go and work on things, and that's quite a different feeling. Uh, I've given many talks on performance engineering where I've done awesome things. I've gone in inside the kernel, and I've written tools that expose latency and heat maps, and those are things I, I, had, I had days to do that. I had weeks to do that. With SRE incident, incident response, you have minutes. And so, and also, you're having to do this when you may not be fully functional. Your brain may be half asleep. So doing performance engineering, the, the breakthroughs that I often have are when I'm fully caffeinated and awake. And it's the best time of day. But obviously, SRE incident response, very different. Also, you can get immediate help from all staff. If Netflix is down, I can ping people, I can page people and say, I need your help right now. That's different from performance engineering because it's not the immediate priority to improve price performance. And you must be social. You must be able to work with lots of people and get them to help. So uh, as we heard earlier from Jonah and Al and Dave, so uh, a, a few of us from, in fact, we have basically all of uh, Netflix, the core SRE team here at SRECon. <laughs> I don't want to jinx anything. We have, a we have a great Netflix environment. I totally trust the fault tolerance. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they do get some help from uh, other teams when there is an immediate issue. Uh, as it happens, the SRE team and the performance engineering team at Netflix uh, sit next to each other. So the sort of tools that SRE Instant Response use, custom dashboards. We have lots and lots of dashboards at Netflix. Central event logs, it's really important to be able to correlate what happened at the given times. Distributed system tracing, and also chat rooms, and, and being able to page people and having a good ticketing system. And so th these are more of the tools of the trade of SRE in comparison to performance engineering. I've summarized the Netflix cloud analysis process. So in summary, we have we often have a, we have a, a central monitoring system called Atlas, which we've open sourced. That will give us an alert we, that can take us to uh, various Atlas dashboards to begin understanding the impact. Uh, Kronos, which is our system for uh, event logging to find out what happened at a given time. And then getting down, using Atlas to come up with custom metrics. We have other tools like Mogul and Salp to check dependencies if there's an issue there. And kind of as a last resort, we can SSH onto an instance and start looking at logs, Java logs, system logs, to see what's wrong there. Uh, at Netflix scale, we have tens of thousands of instances. And so when you're initially paged, you don't know what instance to SSH onto. That's much later in the procedure. There's a big need for, for checklists. And some of this may be obvious. Speed being able to bring Netflix up to resolve an SPS issue or a sign-ups issue, or whatever the issue is, quickly in minutes. Completeness. So a checklist can help tackle a particular performance issue and can include things that may not come to mind under, under pressure at 3 AM. So you can have it all written out. A starting point, something really complicated for Performance engineering is where do I start on a performance issue? And a checklist can say, start here. And also an ending point. I mentioned a bit earlier, with performance engineering, it's endless. Make price performance better, uh, but when, when do you stop? With, when we're triaging an issue live, it's helpful to be able to say, OK, I will try 
I will exonerate the system by going through a simple system checklist. And then you, get, you have an ending point. You can tell other people, I've checked that. It's probably not that. We can now move on. Uh, a reliability, so checklists work at 3 a.m. when your brain does not. And also as a form of training, being able to give checklists to other staff so that they learn how to do SRE instant response. I think performance checklists are particularly interesting. I've written many performance engineering checklists before, so I had many in my last systems performance book. But these were written by Brendan, the performance engineer, with SRE, you, these are still valuable for SRE work, but for incident response, it's a different criteria. Uh, this is similar to, say, uh, the need for checklists for aviation and also medicine, and I've got a couple of references there, uh, including the checklist manifesto. Uh, in aviation, and just as a visual metaphor, so I have a, a Boeing 727 operations manual, or a flight manual, and this is like performance engineering, and so as a, a performance engineering nerd or an aviation nerd, this is great to read and find out how the plane works and how to optimize it. But when it comes to an actual emergency, in red, there is a tag, emergency operating procedures, and it is not many pages. It's only a few pages, because when, when things are going bad, pilots don't have time to read through the entire manual. So uh, it's usually at the end of the, the flight manuals. I collect these, but this one's in the middle. So um, interesting stuff. Medicine has these as well. Uh, NASA has had these as well. So if you've seen, if, if, you've, if you're a NASA buff, you know about the Apollo, Apollo checklists. Those things sound exciting, don't they? I mean, just as exciting as SRE, emergency checklists. So SRE checklists at, at Netflix. We do have some shared docs. So we have a pre-triage methodology and also go triage, which is a dashboard of checklists. Most checklists are actually custom dashboards. And so a developer has created an application and they've said, these are the key metrics that you should check if there's an issue. And that becomes a dashboard. And it's great because our system allows us to share the dashboards as URLs easily in chat rooms. Everyone can jump onto the same dashboard quickly. I also maintain my own per service and per device checklists. So I have a text file that I edit with Vim. Every time we have an incident, I'm always updating it. It's, it's great because I can just search it easily and copy and paste things out of it. Does anyone maintain their own personal checklists for incident response? Oh, there we go. Emacs. Emacs, oh. <laughs> Not sure it works as well. Maybe, maybe it does. <laughs> so hands up if you're using uh, Emacs for your, your <laughs> checklist. There it is. So, um, so I'm using Vim. I'm also actually using the Dvorak keyboard layout. So I don't know, I don't know if you're using that as well for points. Anyone using Dvorak? <laughs> oh, here we go. Yes, I've got one person. Okay, it's even more obscure. Uh, but it's, it's really helpful just to have a text file. It's on my laptop. It always works. I can always update it and maintain it. And I can share it with other people if need be. The performance checklists that I'd like to go through come from cloud. So we have some cloud performance checklists and dashboards. Uh, SSH, jumping onto an instance and figuring things out. And also methodologies for deriving checklists. So checklists, they can be ad hoc. And this is a... Some experiences were found were useful, things, things that typically solve an issue. Checklists can also follow a methodology. And so maybe it is uh, you're trying to follow a process of elimination or differential diagnosis or the use method to come up with a checklist you can apply quickly. Either of them work. With SRE, uh, with performance engineering, we love the methodologies because they, they work forever. They, they seem elegant. Uh, with SRE, it's just about getting the job done. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter if it seems elegant or if it seems dirty. It's about uh, making the customers happy as quick as possible. So the first one I'll do is the pre-triage checklist. And this is our initial checklist. It's a little bit Netflix specific, and so I wasn't going to include it. But I thought I should just include it because there may be things in here that are interesting to you that didn't occur to me. Uh, I should say one thing. I've been at Netflix for over two years, and I thought the pre-triage checklist meant the before-triage checklist. 
And when I was creating the slides, I only just uh, learned that PRE actually stands for Performance and Reliability Engineering. <laughs> so for two years, I've been using this checklist. <laughs> this is a wonderful checklist, a pre-triage checklist. There must be some other checklist in Netflix that I've, I've never made it to, which must be so much better. <laughs> I'm always solving it using the pre-triage checklist. This thing's brilliant. There you go. I just learned that. So it's a shared doc. It's a hierarchical checklist. It has 66 steps total. And the first thing it has is initial impact. So we get paged. Record the timestamp. Really useful for correlation to everything. Quantify, is it stream starts per second? Is it signups? Or is it an uptick in support calls, which we track as well? Check the impact. Is it regional or global? Is it just US East 1 or Europe, or is it worldwide? And also check the device. Is it just PlayStation 3 or Xbox? This helps confirm an issue. So if we see an SPS dip, we know people aren't able to play uh, unless it's an issue with the monitoring system. Uh, that can be backed up by an uptick in support calls. You see an SPS drop and then people phoning Netflix to complain. There's a, there's a real issue. Usually, it doesn't get to that point. We're very quick to respond when SPS begins to dip, uh, quick as in, in terms of seconds. Um, and also, understanding whether it's uh, for a region or if, for, for a particular device, it helps you reason about the ongoing investigation. And so throughout the investigation, you can remember this is US East 1 only, and this is PlayStation 3 only. And then you can, uh, it helps out a lot as well. That information also goes to the top of the ticket. It goes into our chat rooms. And so everyone's on that page. Everyone knows the scope of the issue, the device, how big the dip is. So whether it's a 10% drop or a 50% drop. The second one is time correlations. And so we also have the pre-triage dashboard, which turns out is the performance and reliability engineering dashboard. <laughs> and, uh, and we can check things like the NIWS, the uh, Netflix library client error rates and uh, source of error request rate change to do a little bit of drilling down. Uh, evaluating service health, health. Usually quickly from looking at the pre-triage dashboard and looking at error rates, we can figure out an application or a device that has the issue. And so if it's an application, typically there is a service for that application. And so we have a separate Perf Vitals dashboard, which I'll show in a moment. We have Mogul for dependency correlation. And so Mogul can look at the uh, response time. Say response time increases. We, we know this service has errors and higher latency. You, the computer, tell me who's responsible by doing a correlation of all the other signals we have to the shape of the response time increasing. And so Mogul is so that you, you, as a human, don't have to just go up and down through hundreds and hundreds of dashboards to try and visually compare them. We can get computers to do that pretty well. And so Mogul does that for us. It can, and it can say, out of the, the thousands and thousands of metrics we're collecting, these are metrics closely match the error rate. And so quickly, you can say, oh, that service is connected to this service. And I didn't know that. And now I know that. So Mogul can be pretty helpful. It does have to. Usually, we kick off Mogul, and then we do something else, because it can take a minute for it to come back as it thinks about that. Uh, and then we have various cluster and uh, a, uh, ASG or node types of invest, uh, metrics we look at. Latency, the average, the 90th percentile, other percentiles, the request rate, and so on. So we have custom dashboards that show that to us in a hurry. To show what some of them look like a bit, pre-dash. So pre-dash is developed to support the, the pre-triage checklist. And, oh, and to go further than it, it has key dashboards. And uh, these are all custom dashboards and then various metrics. I'm just going to zoom in on the list of dashboards. And the list of dashboards itself serves as a checklist. So if I'm paged and I'm like, I have no idea where to start, I can go to the top of the first dashboard, click on it, and look for anything anomalous, and then just go down the list of dashboards. That actually works pretty well, because they have a lot of coverage. We have the overview of things like SPS and other key business metrics, client stats, retries, 
NIWS HTTP errors, errors by code, DRM errors, DOS attack metrics, push map, which is really helpful because that shows when developers are pushing changes or making changes to the cloud. And so that might correlate to when we had an issue. Uh, and then cluster status as well, instance status. So just going through the, it's like the dashboard of dashboards, itself serves as a checklist. Perf Vitals is a per service dashboard that has various key performance metrics that might seem quite familiar. So we've got things like uh, requests per second and CPU plotted, the volume or the traffic going to that service, the number of instances, and then how scaling is working. A, a metric which is the cycles per request, which is interesting because if that changes, it, it, uh, it shouldn't really change, cycles per request, but it's a clue that something bad is happening. Uh, load averages can get plotted as well. Uh, Java heap and uh, latency, 99th percentile. So standard uh, system and application metrics. Uh, and of course, we have many more custom dashboards, but this is showing you the, the way of sequence that I'm showing you from the initial investigation, pre-triage checklist, uh, the pre-triage dashboard, perf, well, mogul perf vitals, as we're working, drilling down through an issue to try and find out the cause. Of course, when we're looking through all of this, we went through the first step. So in our mind, we know the time that the, the issue happened uh, and also the impact, whether it's a 5% or 50%, what the region is. And so those are clues and we, can, and we may spot matching patterns. That's great. And I could actually show you lots and lots of uh, very specific application dashboards. They're not terribly useful because they're very specific about uh, logical code. I what I thought it'd be useful is to show what a generic application dashboard could show you. And I would pick these metrics, load, errors, latency, saturation, and instances. If, you're, if you have a new environment and you're trying to understand what should I monitor in terms of performance, this can be a good methodology to draw the functional diagram of your environment. What applications exist? Who's connected to who? And then for each of those applications, say, do we have these five metrics? Put them on the dashboard. And so then that dashboard, you can check those metrics as a checklist uh, to locate issues. So load, problem of load applied. Uh, workload characterization is a methodology in of itself. And many issues can be identified because load increased for some reason. So always worth checking. Errors, errors, timeouts, and retries. Latency, so not just the average, but uh, percentiles, distributions, tail latency. Saturation uh, is a separate metric as well. That's the furthers, it, it's more important information for understanding how overloaded the systems are. Now those four metrics, load errors, latency, and saturation, that I said are really good idea, you should, you should monitor for everything. As it turns out, they're in the site reliability engineering book as well. And so on page, I was very pleased to see that on page 60, it's called the Google's uh, golden statistics, uh, four golden signals, uh, which is great. I have added one, which is uh, instances. And so that's where we want to know the Instance count, the state of the instances, the version of the code they're running. Um, I, and I'm adding that specifically for the Netflix environment because for us, we have auto scaling all the time, we have pushes all the time, we're deployed on the cloud. And so many issues can happen because you have a, uh, we may downscale an application too early. So the downscale ru rules uh, are not working quite well. And so now we have fewer, in, all of a sudden we have fewer instances trying to handle the same amount of traffic and they, they become saturated and their latency goes up and errors go up. And so I've seen dashboards that didn't have the instance count and been pretty confused. It's like, oh, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't know why the, we suddenly have saturation. And as soon as you plot the instance count and you see it go down, it's like, ah, oh, it downscaled. Downscaled in the middle of work. This is, it's pretty obvious. So, it, it is a little specific to our environment, but um, the instance count's very helpful. Also, the state of the instances. When we push out, we have a red-black, uh, the uh, ASG push model on EC2, 
And when new code starts, it advertises itself to our Eureka discovery service. When it's all healthy, then ELBs send traffic to it. There can be a period of time when, there's a period of time when application starts that it shouldn't be receiving traffic. And so if anything goes wrong with that process, maybe it thinks it's, it's in a ready state, but it's not, and it starts accepting traffic too soon, then that traffic can be dropped on the floor, it can error. And again, it's all very obvious when you plot the instance state as well. And you say, oh, we, we had all these services, uh, instances that were not in the healthy state, and yet they started to receive traffic. So we have a bug we should fix. Bad instance dashboard. Um, this is an anti-methodology that I thought I'd include for uh, checklists. And this is where you plot the request time for an instance, you find the bad instance, and then you terminate it. And so here I've got Atlas, which is our cloud-wide monitoring tool. You can click a button when you're looking at latency on a service, and it'll explode it out and show latency for every single instance. It becomes pretty big for some of the, the services. And so you can easily see the outlier and just kill it. As a performance engineer, this makes me cry <laughs> because I want to debug it. I want to know why it was bad. But if I'm on call and it's prime time and I got paged, I'd probably kill the instance because my job in, in that role as an SRE is to make customers happy, is to bring Netflix back online as quick as possible. So. And then afterwards, try and reproduce and try and root cause it so it doesn't happen again. So again, it's, it's, it's something that practically as an SRE you might want to do. But of course, if you are doing this, if you are killing instances, do try to treat them as canaries that something bad is happening. If it happened once, it might happen again. It might be a little signal that later on becomes a bigger signal. So it is worth debugging, but not if your site is down and you need to fix it straight away. Uh, do we, the question is, do we manage to terminate them and save the evidence? We do have heaps of stuff saved. And so Atlas has all the metrics. We do lots and lots of post-termination uh, debugging based on, uh, like, all the logs go to S3. Atlas has, has historical stuff. So there's lots and lots of things we can do. Uh, uh, well, we can, what we can, in some instances, we can just say, stop sending traffic to that instance. And so you just deregister it out of uh, discovery. And so, um, and then, I, I, as a performance engineer, this has happened to me where I've been asked to look at an instance. It's like, you have five minutes of production traffic, go debug this disk issue, and then we're taking it out of discovery. It's like, ah! <laughs> it's like, run all my tools, quick, gather all the metrics. And then, and then traffic is taken off, but I still have the instance I can uh, debug later with whatever the, whatever's in the kernel, whatever state is there. So we do have that option if we want it. We can just turn load off for an instance. As it turns out, we have lots and lots of metrics in Atlas for, for post-termination debugging. So lots more dashboards. We have countless uh, more. They're mostly app-specific and reliability-focused. Uh, I'm talking about performance, but for reliability, uh, it's critical for a lot of these incidents to use Kronos, our uh, event logging system, because then you basically Kronos is who should I blame? Like, Netflix is down, who do we blame? Who's just done a push of, a, of an application? And uh, that solves a lot of the issues. However, sometimes dashboards and monitoring aren't enough. So sometimes we do have to go to uh, SSH. So I did a blog post uh, late last year. Linux performance analysis in 60 seconds. The following few checklists are what I've been uh, particularly working on myself as a performance engineer who's now SRE on call, where when I get paged, I need to be able to do a lot of stuff in the shortest amount of time possible. So a new type of checklists. So if I just had 60 seconds on an instance, what would I type? Uh, and it looks like this. So uptime, dmessage, vmstat, and so on. And the reasons are... Uh, Uptime gives me, uh, actually, let me go through this. I was going to, let's see if I can do this. So I was showing this to other, other engineers at Netflix, and, and they said, can you really do that in 60 seconds? And <laughs> I think I can do it in 60 seconds. So I'm just on an instance. So I just want to create a, just a, a dumb CPU workload. Uh, 
as a performance engineer, you get very good at just like uh, creates just creating stress workloads to debug. It's really stupid, but and so so imagine I'm on an instance. I just want to take a quick look around in 60 seconds. It goes like this: uptime, and I'm looking at the last three digits. 0.22 means load has increased, and it was idle in the past. VM stat. I'm looking for the system-wide metrics. So we're mostly idle, but we've got 50% in user. So I want to look at CPU balance, mpstat minus pol. I see one CPU is 50% user, the other is 100%. That's pretty interesting. PID stat to see who it is. Oh no, that was the all summary. So I've actually just got one CPU is uh, that makes more sense. One CPU is 100%, the other one's idle. Um, and that's going to be my shell, bash, which I just ran. IO stat, just to check disk IO. Um, not much disk IO is happening. We can see CPU is there. Free to check memory, plenty. SAR, to check if there's any network IO happening. We're idle. TCP stats, this is pretty good. Active, passive, and retransmits. Just to look at TCP load. And then I finish with top. And top is a, the system-wide summary of, uh, it gives me some of the metrics I saw earlier going through at the command line, but this refreshes the screen and I can, I can double check things and confirm how they looked. And so here's my 50% of CPU was in user. There's my bash that's eating 100%. So it's a very quick look at the system. And I don't know how long that took, but probably 60 seconds. 72 seconds? <laughs> nice. I, I, have, I, I, I need to rename this Linux performance analysis in 72 seconds. Um, but it gives you, it checks a lot of uh, items. And I think I missed D message minus T tails. I missed one of them anyway. It checks a lot of items. And uh, CPUs, networking, memory, disk IO, uh, kernel errors. And uh, is basically all you can do. When there is a, a Netflix out, outage and you're logging into an instance and you're trying to run things like VMstat, it feels like it takes an eternity to run VMstat 1.5. And sitting there watching VMstat print a line once a second, it's like, Netflix is down. Like, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be using something faster. So it's, this is part of the reason why I've been creating these faster checklists uh, out of my own need so, so I did a quick demo of that. Those are some of the, the fields that I'm looking at. Uh, D messages are always really helpful because sometimes the kernel will tell you, I'm unhappy and this is why. Like maybe it's been doing oom um killing and, and what, what not. And then finishing with top. Other uh, analysis in 60 seconds that we'd like to do Java, Cassandra, MySQL, Nginx, and so on. It would be great to have a performance analysis in 60 seconds checklist for all of these different specialties. You can follow a methodology. Something that's really helpful, I know a lot of us are SREs, to follow the, the process of elimination. So in the checklist, can you exonerate areas of the application and company just by checking a metric? Just to narrow down what's on the operating table. Workload characterization, um, if you can't think of anything else, start with workload characterization because it can often explain issues. Um, and there's many issues which are simply an increase in load. Differential diagnosis, there's lots of methodologies. I've, I've got a collection of them I put online of uh, different methodologies that may be suitable. And you can turn these into dashboards. So uh, the following, I, I'll go more and more at the command line for Linux. But we do want these to be, where possible, dashboards so that you can immediately go to it. Actually logging into an instance should be a last resort. An important one, and sometimes you have to, but uh, as much as possible, get this into a dashboard. So for, I've come up with, a, with another specific checklist. This one's for disk I.O. And I'll explain where this came from. Here's a old performance monitoring uh, product that I worked on many years ago. And the top graph is showing IO bytes per second broken down by disk. 
The second, and you can see there's a couple of dips. The second graph is really interesting. This is disk I.O. operations per second taking at least 520 milliseconds. And you can see there's a spike. That's really interesting. So I'm able to filter and say, you know, this, is, this would be an outlier if I see disk I.O. taking 500 milliseconds. And I can correlate it with the, the dips in I.O. The bottom graph is showing me I.O. operations broken down by latency as a latency heat map. And it shows these two spikes where these, these clouds of really high latency. And it, the latency heat map has the distribution of latency on the y-axis and the passage of time on the x-axis. And that's really good. It shows uh, the, the full distribution by time and how that changes. This is, in, in some ways, this is an ideal dashboard because I helped help design it. And that, that's what I, I mean, we had the capability. I mean, it's, 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 uh, this is what we want to see. I mean, it needs to have errors as well. and need disk errors. Uh, and that was very effective at the time. This particular picture, I'll tell you the story from it though, I was working on a storage appliance and I was benchmarking right throughput. And I'd been spending a few days in the data center, um, trying different configurations, optimizing it. Everything was great. But then when I was doing the final run, right throughput dropped for a period of seconds during my final run. And I could see it in all the graphs because I'm recording it in perpetuity at one second granularity. And I was like, oh, why did write throughput drop? So I'm looking at everything. The system seems fine. And I, I, I must have spent a few hours just checking everything, top to bottom of the system. Everything's fine. Uh, one of my coworkers, Adam, he'd noticed a problem with some of our systems that uh, the disks in the JBODs had loose screws, and that meant they could vibrate a bit more. And our data center was next to a bus stop, and buses would drive by. And it's like, I can't find the source of this latency. Maybe it's buses. Maybe it, like, with their compression brakes. Maybe that happened when I was benchmarking and, and with a loose screw and, and all of these reasons. We also had uh, in the data center this giant canister of FM200, the fire suppression system, and an FM200 emergency control panel on the, on the data center wall. And for some reason, this suppression system had an alarm that day that the, when we looked it up, the alarm meant the system was normal. And so you have this, <laughs> this screeching alarm, and it's like, what's happening? And like, like we've, we've seen the, the safety video where when FM200 fires, you have 20 seconds to leave the data center. And, and like it, it's, you don't want to be around when the, when the thing fires. And so with the alarm going off, we're all wondering if we, we should be donning oxygen masks and escaping the building. But as it turns out, the alarm meant nothing. It's like, I'm happy. <laughs> like, there is no problem. I'm just going to screech at you. So I also, I'm wondering, maybe it's the alarm. Maybe the alarm was like, because uh, the loose screw, the drive is not in its proper configuration. So I uh, have a look at the, I, I, I open up the JBOD, look at all the disks, and I find that some of the screws were loose. So I tighten them, and like, that's great. Problem should be fixed, right? I do some more benchmarks, same problem. I get these dips. I was like, ah, oh, I, I, I can't understand. I can't, maybe, maybe it's unrelated to the loose screw. Maybe it's just like, there's still the buses that come by with their compression brakes. And I was having lunch, and I was talking to a colleague, and it's like, how can I test my theory of like whether it's uh, noise is causing it? And I had this idea of like I'd go and download tone generators on my MacBook, and I'd, I'd play it to the JBODs, and I'd, I'd go through the frequency range. Like we've all heard of the brown note. I was wondering if there was a, a rust note <laughs> that would cause the disks to, these are rotational disks, that would cause them to perform badly. And so, I sit down and I'm like, I'm, I'm browsing all these websites and like, oh look, here's a tone generator and then it goes and I can't download, I can't run it, and there's all this adware. And out of frustration, it's like, you know what, I've got a tone generator, it's my mouth. I'm just gonna go and shout at the disks <laughs> and see if I can cause it. And so that's what I did. And my coworker, Brian, <laughs> said, this is really funny, we should video it and stick it on YouTube. <laughs> and that's the screenshot. Has anyone seen me shouting at JPods on YouTube? Yes, most people. That's how it came about. 
So I was troubleshooting a disk performance issue. So I found out I could shout at the disks and cause latency. <laughs> but the other great thing that, I, that the video was demonstrating, and that was like 2008, is heat maps, latency heat maps. So this is an ideal dashboard. Now, that was using Dtrace, and Dtrace let us do efficient in-kernel aggregations, and we had a real-time system. On Linux, we're now getting to the point where we can do this. And so now, I have this ideal Linux checklist. So, IO stat is what I'd start with, VM stat, uh, DF minus H, because some file systems, they behave badly when they approach 100% CPU. And then I want to go straight into things like EXT4 slower or ButterFS slower or whatever the file system you're using. That's a new tool that I've written using Linux BPF that can tell me if there are outliers and measure it at the file system level, not at the disk level. Uh, BIO slower to go down to the disk level. EXT4 disk to show me the histograms. And that's what I should turn into a heat map. Bio disk to do the same thing at the disk level, XT4 is at the file system level. And I also want to check errors as well. So like uh, if you're on hard, uh, physical Linux, there is an IO error count. Um, Smart CTL has loads and loads of stuff as well. So the procedure I'm following here where I'm looking at outliers, well, I'm, I'm beginning by just looking to see if there's disk IO in the first place. People often blame the disks, it's not the disks. <laughs> and you run IO stat and there's just no disk IO. I was like, okay, not the disks. Let's look, at, let's look at something else. So you want that first, just to check if it even makes sense to be looking at the disks. Uh, I have VMstat in there, actually, because you can have a high file system workload that's hitting out of cache. And the problem is CPU. Even though your application is doing what it thinks is doing a lot of disk I.O., it's a CPU issue, and you could see that as high system time. Or you may have disk I.O. because it's swapping, and both of them are visible in VMstat. But if you look at some of these other ones where I've got ext4 slower uh, and then ext4 dist, this is simulating what that dashboard does. So I asked that at the top to look at the rate, then I've got my outliers, and then I've got the distribution, the heat map at the bottom. And so now we get to do this on Linux uh, with new tools like ext4 slower, so we get to do the full checklist. And so ext4 slower, it's really cool. ext4 slower one, it'll just tell me the uh, I.O. slower than one millisecond, and measure that at the file system level. Um, it's a better indication of application pain than disk I.O., because this is what the application is actually blocked on. Uh, it's using BPF, and it's using front-end tools called BCC. BPF is coming. So the dashboard I showed was using superpowers from uh, Solaris, Dtrace. And Linux hasn't had these superpowers, although there's been many different efforts to come up with traces and whatnot. BPF is the one that's being integrated into the kernel, enhancements to BPF. Although it didn't begin life as a uh, system tracer, it began life as Berkeley packet filter. Uh, for, this is what TCP dump can use to optimize those expressions. Then it was enhanced to do software-defined networking. Um, and Plum Grid was using it to do these uh, virtual networks and products. And then we realize it's like, this thing's so powerful. It can run bytecode in the kernel, and it can attach to k-probes. We could port my old Dtrace toolkit scripts over to BPF, even though it's this software-defined networking tool, and it will probably run them. And so uh, we can. And, and BPF nowadays, this shows a screenshot from, um, uh, this is Trace EX3, which is actually in the Linux source code. This is an example of BPF that ships with Linux. It's in mainline Linux. And it's doing a, a histogram, or a heat map of disk IO latency, uh, just rotated 90 degrees. Uh, and that's built into the kernel. This is great. Uh, I think I was actually demoing Linux 4.0 uh, with patches. So that should be in 4.1. Uh, and you're able to now do this. So BPF is coming. Hands up if you run at least 4.1. OK, not that many people. <laughs> So we've got, got, got maybe 10% of people. Uh, in the future, uh, BPF will, will be there. And we've been adding things to 4.4, 4.5, 4.6. Uh, Alexei Staratoyev is the lead developer. He's, uh, he was at Plum Grid. He's now at Facebook. He just did trace points for BPF. That patch just made it into NetNext yesterday at 6 PM. It's really exciting. Uh, and BPF is approaching completion. 
So dashboards in the future for Linux should look quite different and should include things like this. It, it can do this quite efficiently, uh, heat maps and all sorts of other tracing. So pretty exciting stuff. But uh, it, it will require you to upgrade your Linux kernel at some point. Uh, Linux uh, network checklist and this one is, is similar. It's, it's, we're at the point where it can now be ideal and we can do what I want. And uh, SAR minus N, dev, e dev. I, I have some of these in the performance analysis in 60 seconds. The SAR minus N, dev, and e dev gives you the uh, the network interface throughput and errors. And so just check the workload. Uh, network, network interfaces have limits. You may have a firewall that imposes other throttling limits. And so just early on checking where we're at. Are we, are we doing trying to do a gigabyte per second or 100 megabytes per second? Then going into the TCP level, active passive load, <laughs> checking resolve.conf because it's always DNS. DNS is always breaking things. Uh, MP stat to see another issue that can just quick to identify straight away is your application may now be getting load for the first time ever and gets throttled by one CPU because of the way it's configured. It's not doing fan out properly. It's not using Linux uh, RPS or anything like that. And so one CPU which is handling the network interrupts gets hot and now you're flatlining. So you want to identify that early. Some new BPF tools like TCP retrans, connect, accept, and so on. And uh, uh, checking for routes in case like there's some dumb route that's sending packets the wrong way. Checking firewall config, also another, another thing that's worth checking. NetSAP minus S, I'm not sure I should really have this in an SRE incident response checklist. It's like a 252 metric pickup. There's way too much stuff in NetSAP minus S and they keep adding things, which is good and bad because we need some of the new statistics. Uh, just to give you an idea of the new tools that we're getting out of BPF, so here's TCP retrans. It's tracing kernel, TCP retransmit functions, and just tell it, telling us. This is much, much better than, say, TCP dump of send receive and trying to figure it out with, with Wireshark. They're great tools, and they're great for troubleshooting if you want to capture the whole session. But if you just want to know connects or retransmits or the, the weird stuff, uh, you can use the kernel traces to trace that directly. And of course, BPF, which is now making it, the enhancements are making it into the four series, mean we can write these programs and uh, put them into the BCC package, so it's really exciting. I have a Linux CPU checklist as well, but I have a cool story about it. One I found recently, and that was, I was looking at one of our application instances in production running mpstat minus p1, which is from the, the 60 seconds checklist. And every so often, all the CPUs would go to idle except for one. And, and or all the CPUs would go down to 50% except for one. And it's like, oh, every 10, 15, 20 seconds. I plotted it as a graph, and you can see it's ragged. This is CPU utilization. When I plotted it per CPU, you see these big dips. So all the CPUs go down, except one can still be running. This is a Java application. Any guesses what that could be? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, we're like, well, what's the guess? Garbage, garbage collection. So it's garbage collection. All right, so we've got a garbage collection issue. So go and look at the GC log, nothing. GC log says, oh, GC's running in like th three to 10 milliseconds. And it's like, oh, no, but it's got to be garbage collection. <laughs> so. So I created a uh, sub-second offset heat map. And so what I'm doing here is I'm on the y-axis, it is the sub-second time within a second, and the x-axis is the passage of time. And it's like a raster. It paints the, the pixel blocks using a color depth of how many CPUs were, were running. And so the darker, uh, the more CPUs running, the darker it is. And you can see these gaps every so often. And so those gaps are when only one thread was running. I noticed the output of perf, which I was using to monitor it, uh, 
It normally prints the CPU ID of each sample, and this is a 32 CPU server, so it's like a random number generator. But there were these runs where there was only one CPU. And so I programmatically filtered out just, take the output of Linux perf script, if only one CPU is making forward progress, pluck out those samples and turn it into a flame graph. And so I haven't published this tool yet, but I will. It's a tool for visualizing the one guy that's blocking everyone else. So the one thread that's blocking the rest of the world from making forward progress. And it turns out it was uh, code cache. So code cache cleanup. Uh, our code cache on Java was reaching a gigabyte. It would do cleanup. And when it was doing cleanup, it was doing stop the world. Um, code cache happens after GC. So GC would happen like in parallel really quick. And then code cache would block the world for 500 milliseconds as it did its cleanup. Interesting stuff. How would you determine that in a hurry? I do have a checklist for it. So uh, basics like uptime, VM stat, MP stat to look at the CPU balance, PID stat to look at it per CPU. Flame graphs are awesome for CPU profiling and uh, sub-second offset heat map, which I just showed. Now, there's HTOP, uh, flame graphs. Who's using flame graphs? Okay, good. So we, so we have at least a dozen people. Flame graphs are just a great visualization for profiling uh, and understanding what's going on. And I have used these during a Netflix uh, incident because we've automated it in our tool. So we can bring it up in a hurry. Um, I'll mention the tools method quickly. Uh, this is an anti-methodology where you run everything and hope for the best. And for SRE resp response, it's just a mental checklist. <laughs> a mental checklist to see what might have been missed. And so I've included this in the slides. So I have these on my cubicle wall. And if I'm completely lost, I can be like, I don't know, man, <laughs> what have I forgotten to look at? And I can just go around it. I created these so that I can use them, but I've sh shared them, obviously. Um, observability, I'll share these slides, observability tools, static performance tools, uh, my perf tools, and then the new BCC tools, which use BPF. Uh, the last checklist I have is the use method. And the use method is nice and simple. It's a methodology where for every resource, you check utilization, saturation, and errors. Utilization is busy time, saturation is queued time, and errors are easy. And you can do this for hardware. So every component on a system, I would just want those three metrics. And it's, it's great because it narrows it down, uh, because there's lots of system metrics. And it also poses the questions you really want answered, rather than making do with what the system gives you. I've turned this into actual checklists, which I've posted online. Um, they're really horrible to go through, because they involve running the universe of stuff. But we should turn these into dashboards. Uh, and we've been doing some of that work at Netflix. Uh, and also, for distributed systems, these can be applicable as well. So each component in your environment, just those three metrics, utilization, saturation, errors, a little like the uh, four or five metrics I mentioned earlier. And I mentioned Netflix Vector. This is an instance analysis tool we have. It's open source. And this dashboard has, you can see the influence of the use method where we can go straight to an instance and start looking at CPU utilization and saturation, network utilization and saturation, memory utilization and saturation, and so on. We still need to add a few more metrics to this, but uh, it gives us that very quick overview of system health. And then a bonus checklist, external factors. Um, and I thought it was worth including this in here. <laughs> At Netflix, we can get alerted because there's, there's some sporting events, sports ball. Uh, there's power outage, and that affects SPS. S SPS goes down because people can't watch Netflix because power is actually down. Uh, snowstorms, more people watch Netflix because people are staying indoors and watching and turning it on. Uh, other things going down. And also Chaos Kong. You know, we do our own uh, Chaos Kong exercises to simulate uh, availability zone failures. So these all muck with SPS and, and, and alert us, although we can turn them off if, if we know Chaos Kong is coming. Um, but it's another mental checklist we have uh, for incident, incident response. I, I use Twitter because it's actually pretty helpful to search for like Netflix is down and people are posting pictures of their screen. And it uh, can be not safe for work, but uh, <laughs> generally it's pretty helpful. And also like if there's power outages. 
so that's my talk about checklists, uh, and, and it was, it was, it's been great to share some checklists for SRE. Some takeaways, checklists are great. So speed, uh, obviously suitable for incident response. Completeness, so you can construct the checklist when you're caffeinated and with well thinking and make sure everything's on there. And then during the emergency, when it's the middle of the night or the pressure's on, you're still checking everything. You're going through the checklist. The starting and ending point, it's great for beginners who are learning this because they know where to begin. In fact, my personal checklists, I have, I have checklists for like PlayStation and Xbox and all the devices and then all the applications. And I have just a generic one. It's like, I'm lost. I just have no idea. And if I'm lost, I can just go to the generic one and, and, and work my way through it. They can be ad hoc or from a methodology. Uh, we can create service dashboards to facilitate this type of analysis, or quick analysis. And I know everyone's basically doing this anyway, and they serve as checklists. And in the future, we should be seeing much better system dashboards with Linux BPF, now that we have that capability in the four series kernel. I've been trying to talk to a lot of people about when you're going to uh, switch to the newer kernel, and uh, they say, oh, We've been on, we're still on 2632. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, all the kernel engineers are like working so hard, adding features, and you, you're still running something from many years ago. So uh, maybe this will be the incentive to actually come onto a newer kernel, uh, because you'll be able to use uh, many more metrics and come up with better dashboards. So please create and share more checklists, especially if you, if you have domain expertise in a, in, a, in a runtime or a database or, or whatever it is, you can probably come up with the best 60-second checklist there is for incident response and then share that. So I have references there, including some of the books I mentioned. And that's my talk. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions, and then we'll break for beer. The slides, I will put them on, so I'll upload them to SlideShare, so the link is there as well. And Netflix is also hiring SREs, so you get to, maybe our, our five-person core team will be 10 people by the time uh, we, we, uh, we talk to everyone and figure it out, so that would, that would be great. Um, and you can talk to us afterwards. So a couple of questions, yes. So first off, I really honored to meet someone who can actually claim to have used the weirding way to troubleshoot a system. Uh, you know, I, I, I call you Brendan Mwadib Greg from this point forward. Um, uh, I had a question about Mogul, uh, and I'm curious, you know, it looks like it's something that you guys run kind of as a, a batch process process that you kick off when you think there might be a problem. Yeah. Uh, does it often find things that are actually, you know, you find causes out of this or just out of these correlations? And why would you uh, not run that as a, like a continual uh, correlation service? So the question is Mogul, which is doing the, I have a signal, error signal, latency signal. Who else is related to that? And then to, to do the, the matching. It's, we do run it when there's an incident. It's CPU. It's a new, it's a new, New. It's been like around for like over a year now, uh, or a couple of years. It uh, is a little bit CPU intensive, and it uh, makes a lot of requests to Atlas to drag in all the metrics. So there would be an expense to have this running continually because it would be chewing on metrics a lot. Sure. It may be, and that's because it's an add-on application. And so, uh, if you were a company and you wanted to build this, you might be cleverer and build it straight into the, the central monitoring product as a core technology. Um, the way it's currently implemented, that would be a little bit CPU expensive. But continually identifying correlations like that could be, could be quite interesting. We haven't done it yet. We, we have something similar, and I was just curious what you're Cool. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Hi. Uh, how many data points do you need to determine that a performance issue actually requires an action or a change versus some one-off thing? You can just destroy the instance and spin up something new. Ah, how many performance data points n require us to, to do a change versus just killing the instance? Uh, just in general, like, you know, oh, it's not going to happen again, or if it does, we don't care. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the scale of the outage. Uh, if we had one outlier instance on a uh, cluster and, ne ne and Netflix was, was down and customers were hurting, we'd just be inclined to kill things and do what it takes. Uh, and, and try and troubleshoot afterwards. I don't think there's a, a number I'd put on. It, it, it just depends on the priority and um, 
the amount of pressure we're under. So uh, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever it takes to, to get things back, on, back running and then troubleshoot afterwards. Uh, Rick Farrow. So I, I thought Berkeley Packet Filter is just for the networking stack. Are you implying that it's going to be doing other things as well? It is doing other things. So BPF, Berkeley Packet Filter, we, we've been trying to come up, naming is hard, we've been trying to come up with a better name. Maybe we'll call it Bytecode Probe something. <laughs> framework. Bytecode Probe Framework, that's it. Um, be, because it has just grown and evolved. Factory, <laughs> by code pro practice. Yeah, 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 I understand it's compiled. I thought it was limited in what it can do. You're saying it can do anything in the kernel. That's right. And oh, cool. because, because, the, because it can now attach to K probes, U probes, uh, trace points as of 6 p.m. yesterday. Mm. And, uh, and it's almost basically does everything we need it to do. So, Thank yeah, you. It's, it's, it's confusing because if you, if you try and Google it and search for it, you, you're reading all about networking. But it's something that is. We should come up with a better name. Uh, we've discussed it. We've had some terrible names, like the Tracinator or something like that. But uh, Brendan's performance filter. Brendan's performance filter. It, it's confusing because the other guy working on it is Brendan Blanco, so you wouldn't know which one. Okay, thanks. One more question. Well, my question is: Are you okay with me closing this out? Yes. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>